So our Bible reading this week comes from the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 18 and verses 1 to 15. Genesis 18 from verse 1. The Lord appeared to Abraham near the great trees of Mamre while he was sitting at the entrance to his tent in the heat of the day. Abraham looked up and saw three men standing nearby. When he saw them, he hurried from the entrance of his tent to meet them and bowed low to the ground. He said, If I have found favour in your eyes, my lord, do not pass your servant by. Let a little water be brought and then you may all wash your feet and rest under this tree. Let me get you something to eat so that you can be refreshed and then go on your way now. Now that you have now that you have come to your servant. Very well, they answered, do as you say. So Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah. Quick, he said, get three sears of the finest flour and knead it and bake some bread. Then he ran to the herd and selected a choice tender calf and gave it to a servant who hurried to prepare it. He then brought some curds and milk and the calf that had been prepared and set these before them. While they ate, he stood near them under a tree. Where is your wife, Sarah? they asked him. There in the tent, he said. Then one of them said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Now Sarah was listening at the entrance to the tent, which was behind him. Abraham and Sarah were already very old, and Sarah was past the age of of childbearing. So Sarah laughed to herself as she thought, after I am worn out and my Lord is old, Will I now have this pleasure? Then the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Will I really have a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return to you at the appointed time next year, and Sarah will have a son. Sarah was afraid, so she lied and said, I did not laugh. But he said, Yes, you did laugh. So let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your amazing word and how much we can learn from it and how much it speaks to us. Um, And we pray, Lord, that we would be open today to what you want to say to us and how you want to challenge us through this passage. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So I've really enjoyed recently watching a program um, on iPlayer called Race Across the World. I don't know um, if anybody has seen this at all. I completely missed it when it was actually on TV, Um, but I've been catching up with it recently and I've found it really gripping and addictive, really enjoyed it. Um, Basically, if you don't know about it, what they did was this. They had Um, five teams of ordinary Brits they were pairs so they had like a mother and son a husband and wife an uncle and nephew and um, all of these pairs started off well for the second series it was in Mexico City and they weren't allowed to fly they were given the price of an airfare and they weren't allowed to look at they weren't allowed to have smartphones they weren't allowed to have credit cards and they had to get from Mexico City all the way through the whole of Central and South America to um, Ushuaia which is like the tip bottommost tip of Argentina at the very bottom of South America and on the way they passed through 16 countries they passed through deserts through jungles through cities um, and they had to go over land they weren't allowed to fly um, and they just had to rely on their ingenuity and their teamwork and it was just brilliant I'd really recommend watching it Um, but one of the things that happened during the series is that their money slowly slowly begins to run out and as that happens the teams learn more and more to depend on the kindness of strangers so maybe they're given a meal or given a lift Um, They're welcomed into the homes of ordinary South American families. And, you know, it is these encounters, these encounters with strangers that are the most memorable parts of the journey. It's those parts that transform them, those parts that pull them out of their 
competitiveness out of the race, out of their selfishness, perhaps show them a different, simpler way of life and they experience community and gratitude and blessing. And it did remind me of that verse that we, um, we looked at earlier on um, in Hebrews. Uh, Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers, for by so doing, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. Now, of course, back in Abraham's day, there were no cars, there were no buses, there were no aeroplanes, there was no Airbnb, there weren't even really any inns or hotels to speak of. And also people didn't really travel much. They didn't go on holiday as such. And so if they did travel, usually they were traveling for really important, grave reasons and usually negative reasons. So perhaps they were fleeing persecution, like we thought of the people in Afghanistan fleeing persecution. Or sometimes they were traveling in order to find food. And we can think of quite a few examples of this from the Bible. So we think of Jacob who travels because he's worried that his brother Esau is going to kill him, so he runs away. Uh, Joseph travels to Egypt because he is trafficked, he's sold into slavery, and that's why he ends up going there. But then, of course, later he's followed by his brothers, isn't he? Because there's a famine in Canaan and they go to look for food. And similarly, in the book of Ruth, we see Naomi and her family travelling from Bethlehem in Israel to Moab in order to escape a famine. Last week we talked about God being a generous host, welcoming us into his feast. But in today's story, God is the guest. God is the guest. And one commentator puts it like this. God chooses to take on the persona of a hungry, tired and thirsty traveller, a would-be refugee with no place to stay and waits to be invited in. Despite being the ruler of the universe, God hides his glory and status in order that he can receive hospitality from those he has created. What an incredible demonstration of the humility of God. So God comes to Abraham as a traveller in disguise. And when we look at the life of Jesus, we can see that this isn't the only time that this happens. Jesus is often the person that receives hospitality. Think of the newborn baby Jesus in the manger, in the back room of an inn in Bethlehem. Think of Jesus sitting down by a well and asking a Samaritan woman to give him water. Think of Jesus at the home of Martha and Mary. Jesus in a borrowed room celebrating the Passover meal with his disciples. Jesus, the guest. In Revelation chapter 3 verse 20, we have these words. Here I am, says God. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. Do you know, God doesn't need to knock. He doesn't need to knock. He made us, he's in charge. He could force his will. He could force his way in. But our God, as we see in this story from Genesis, comes humbly in the guise of a weary traveller, asking for our hospitality, asking for us to invite us in. Invite him in, sorry. So that's my first challenge for you this morning have you invited him in let's see what abraham does in the story that we read now in verse one um, it says that the lord appeared to abraham but actually what abraham sees is three men and we as readers know that it's the lord because the storyteller tells us that we know that it's god come to see him but Abraham we, doesn't know that as far as we know. Maybe he has a sense that it's someone important or significant because he actually seems to really go out of his way to make them welcome. But equally, maybe that's how Abraham would have treated any traveller that he saw passing by. In any case, the way that Abraham responds to these three visitors could be seen as a model 
of biblical hospitality. So let's think a bit about what he does. And I think we can learn a lot from Abraham's hospitality to these God strangers here in this story. First of all, Abraham is ready. He's ready for them. They don't seem to catch Abraham particularly by surprise or interrupt him napping. He's not too busy to welcome them. Abraham is at the door of his tent. He's on the lookout. He's waiting for opportunities to offer hospitality. And actually, this kind of goes along with the character of Abraham as we know it. Um, Abraham has heard God speaking to him before. He's been listening. He's been awake and alert. His seems to be a life of readiness, a readiness to jump into the unknown, to leave behind what is familiar and to kind of launch himself into God's future for him without knowing the destination. And equally here, he seems to launch himself into hospitality of these people, of these men, uh, without knowing who they are or, or what they're bringing to him. I wonder... Are we sitting at the door of our tent? Are we ready? Or are we hiding away behind carefully crafted walls that keep everybody out? Are we on the alert for God's interruptions, awake and ready, looking for opportunities to have encounters with people, friends and strangers that God sends our way? Are we the kind of people who, like Abraham, are listening, who are connected to God, open to his spirit, open to what new things he might have for us today? It's a challenge for us. Are we ready? The second thing we can see from Abraham is that he is generous and lavish in his treatment of the strangers. Now, when you read Bible stories, quite often there's not a lot of detail. They're quite spare and sparse in their detail. And um, so actually, when there are details given to us, we can really see each little detail as being significant. And here in this story, we're told that um, Abraham gives them bread, which is baked with the finest flour. And we're also told that he doesn't just choose any old calf to kill for them, but he chooses a choice, tender calf. Abraham also is described as hurrying. He's in a hurry to get everything ready as soon as possible. And there is no expense spared. The principle at work here is a principle of honouring, a principle of honouring people, treating one another as we would like to be treated ourselves. When I was in Senegal, I spent quite a lot of time in a village in the countryside called Buhu, um, and it was a wonderful place. And the hospitality that I experienced there was tremendous. People in that village didn't really have much. Um, it was still a place where, you know, the women did that thing where they um, bashed the, the millet with a, with big pestles. I don't know if you've seen uh, any that people doing that, but... You know, it's like something amazing, something you've seen on TV, really. There was no electricity in the village. There were animals kind of wandering around uh, and they still drew their water from a well every day. They didn't have running water there either. And uh, when it came to meals, people would sit around like a big communal plate to eat um, and quite often were eating with their hands. And what you were supposed to do is when you sat around this big plate and there was a whole sort of family around the plate, you were supposed to like imagine that it was like a pie and that you had your piece of pie in front of you and you were supposed to eat your bit that was in front of you like that. But the the uh, the hosts would quite often take the choicest pieces of meat or fish or whatever and they would put them in my bit of pie because I was like the honoured guests. Um, And uh, it just seemed like such wonderful hospitality from these people that really didn't have much in comparison to me. So this raises the question for me, what can we do to honour the people that God places in our path? As we return to our church building, how can we welcome people? How can we honour the people that God sends through our doors, particularly strangers, particularly guests or visitors or people new to our church. Here's what Jesus 
says in Matthew 7 verse 12, um, it's very well known, this is often called the golden rule. So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. Do to others what you would have them do to you. Now, I don't know if you've ever been um, to a different church for the first time. Um, Perhaps when you've been on holiday, maybe you've tried out um, other churches. Now, I'm a Baptist minister and I'm the daughter of a Methodist minister. And I've been to lots and lots of churches in my lifetime. But even I find it intimidating going to a new church for the first time. You don't know where to sit. You don't know what you're supposed to do. You don't know who's who. Um, So think what it must be like for somebody who's not been to church for a long, long, long time, or perhaps even never been to church, like quite a lot of people now. And think what it must be like for them. Imagine that's you for a moment, trying church for the very first time, maybe. How would you like to be treated when you came through the door? What would make you feel welcome? What would make you feel like an honoured guest? In everything, says Jesus, do to others what you would have them do to you. Honouring people, treating them with respect and dignity as people made in the image of God, being open and generous, going out of our way to welcome them. Why is this important? Well, this is important because God comes to us often in the guise of a stranger. When Abraham welcomes these three men, he doesn't know who they are, but actually he is welcoming God. He's welcoming the good news of the promise of God into his and Sarah's lives. Because actually these men come with a word from God, which is good news. And it's good news that Abraham and Sarah have been waiting for for many, many years. The news that they will soon have a son and that God's promises to them are going to be fulfilled. And they come with this amazing word from God in Genesis um, 18 verse 14. I'm going to finish with this. Is anything too hard for the Lord? Is anything too hard for the Lord? Sarah doesn't believe the promise. When the uh, the men tell her this, she looks at herself. She looks at herself, at her worn out body, at her husband who is old. And she thinks back on all the years of failure and disappointment. And she doesn't believe. She looks at herself and doesn't believe. And I can identify with this because when I look at myself, I often don't believe either. I don't believe that I can do it. I don't believe that God can use me. I don't believe that I can cope with what, what's thrown at me day by day. I don't believe that I'm strong enough, wise enough, good enough to fulfil God's call on my life. And maybe you can identify with that. Maybe you look at yourself and your situation and you feel a similar despair to Sarah and maybe sometimes we even look at our church and feel a bit like that so many wonderful people like Beryl have died or moved away or their health has declined and we laugh and think God can't do anything with us but the good news of God asks us to repent it asks us to turn around to turn our faces away from our own weakness and brokenness and towards God, towards a God who comes humbly, who comes in the guise of a stranger, who doesn't force himself on us, but nevertheless comes with a promise that nothing is too hard for him, that no word from God shall ever fail, that all things are possible with God. How's God speaking to you today? Perhaps God's asking you to be ready, to be ready for him, to be open to the encounters that he's prepared for you this week. Opportunities for you to demonstrate to friends and strangers his love and generosity and hospitality. Who knows, you might find that by doing so, you're entertaining angels unawares. 
who are coming with messages for you from God. Or perhaps today you're broken and feel like giving up on God's promises like Sarah. Perhaps today God is knocking at your door, asking to come in for dinner because he's got good news to speak into your life. Good news that there is hope in Jesus as we were singing, that nothing is too hard for the Lord. Here I am, says Jesus. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. Let's open the door and let him in today. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this example of Abraham and the hospitality that he gives. And we pray that like him, we might be ready, we might be open to the encounters you've prepared for us this week. And we pray that we will be ready as a church too, to welcome all who come through our doors. We pray that we will be able to honour the people we meet because they are people created in your image and people that um, may have messages for us from you or people with whom we can share your good news too. And Lord God, we confess to you that often we feel like Sarah. We look at ourselves and we feel like giving up sometimes. We feel like we can't do it. And we laugh to ourselves and think, what is this promise from God? But Lord, we know that you have the words of eternal life. We know that nothing is too hard for you. And we know that you are at work in each of our lives, even those of us who feel like we're past it. It's never too late that you're still always at work in us and through us and for us. And so, Lord, we pray that you'll help us to open our hearts to you this week and be open to what you want to do in our, in our lives. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.